Thank you very much. I'm going to be reading from Luke's Gospel. My subject this morning is hospitality and God's grace. So I'm going to be reading from Luke's Gospel. I'm going to be reading quite a few verses from verse 7 to verse 24. So let's... And Jesus is at a meal. Verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back. And so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another one said, I've just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. So I hope that you have been on the receiving end of hospitality. Let's have a show of hands who has been on the receiving end of someone's hospitality. Yeah, most people. Uh, and, And also that you have been able to give hospitality to others. I know personally what it's like to be on the receiving end of someone's hospitality on many occasions, both here and abroad. I know a little bit of what it's like to be a stranger in a foreign country and not knowing anyone and not being able to speak the language. And through those experiences, I know a bit of what it's like to be made to feel welcomed and made to feel like part of the family. I know what it's like for those who are strangers to become good friends, who are a tremendous blessing to me. So I've been on the receiving end of hospitality. So when we think about hospitality, it's much more than having a nice dinner together. It's about God's generous heart being revealed, both revealed to us and to those around us around us. God invites us to become his friends, to be accepted and made welcome by him. God went out of his way in this invitation by sending his beloved son Jesus to invite us. So what can we learn from these passages? Well the first thing that Jesus is saying and he speaks to the guests is he says have a humble attitude. See in Middle Eastern culture And to some extent, in aspects of our culture as well, which I'll mention in a moment, in Middle Eastern culture, there was a seat of honor at a banquet where the host sat. And the closer you were seated to the host, the greater your status would be. So Jesus saw how people were sitting themselves nearest to the host, the place of most prestige. And he said, don't take the seat nearest to the host. It'd be a bit like, for example, the queen holds a state banquet and obviously she's the host. So she sits in the place of highest honor. 
So I w- looked at some photographs of a state banquet that she had for the president of uh, China recently, and I looked at the seating arrangement. Who do you think sat at her right hand? Oh, it was the president of China, because he was the most honoured guest. On her left sat the Duke of Edinburgh. And um, imagine if the Prime Minister had gone, or another guest had gone just before the banquet began and decided to sit at the right hand of the Queen. And well, someone would have come up to them and said, I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> well, probably you wouldn't have said mate, but you know what I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but you can't sit there. Even if it was the Prime Minister, that is reserved for the President of China. So this is a kind of setting, similar kind of thing that was going on at this time. Jesus is saying here, at every level, humble yourself. Don't push yourself forward. And actually, this is a theme. This was not something new that Jesus was revolutionary bringing forward because we can read about it in the Old Testament. In Proverbs first, uh, 20, uh, chapter 25, it says, Do not exalt yourself in the king's presence and do not claim a place among his great men. It is better for him to say to you, come up here, than for him to humiliate you before his nobles. So Jesus is just picking something from the Old Testament. It's just a principle of life. So why would people in this setting want to uh, sit nearest the host? Well, I guess we all want affirmation. We all want to feel significant. We all want to feel valued. The problem is how we may go about getting that. The problem is this. The more you seek to get affirmation and acceptance from others, the less likely you are to get it. A bit like drinking seawater, never quench your thirst for meaning and significance in your life. For example, you may, and sometimes I find myself doing it, I have to watch myself, and Rich told us that last week, watch yourselves. Um, You know, sometimes it's, we, we put our best foot forward, if you like. We want to put ourselves in the best possible light. So we let slip some of the tales of good that we have done. Or perhaps some of the successes we have done. Because we're seeking affirmation. We're seeking a sense of value. We're seeking a sense of significance. And maybe that's why we do that from time to time. Or things that you see on social media, for example. I've seen lots of these. And um, maybe I'm just a bit cynical about when I read these tales that people tell on places like Facebook. Where they say, oh, I'm having such a bad day. Or, I'm feeling very sad today. Or, oh, I just, it's, it's so lonely, I'm feeling really down. And I must admit, I asked myself, going, well, why, did, why have you written that? What's the, what's the motive behind that? And perhaps I'm just being cynical, but I think maybe there's a, an element of self-pity coming out here. There's an element of seeking sympathy. There's, a, there's an element of seeking affirmation here from others. Well, if you go about seeking affirmation, significance, and value by putting your best foot forward in order to impress people or t- telling a tale of woe, it's not going to work. You can look for acceptance and significance by playing the look at me card, but it doesn't work. However... If we give to others relationally, out of love, out of valuing the other person, then the more affirmation and acceptance we will get. So how might you do that? Well, personally, I find it helpful to try and avoid a me-centered approach. You know, and we all kind of have that within us, don't we, if we're honest? That it's a bit like a compass and you have magnetic north. And the compass, wherever you go, it will point in the northern hemisphere anyway. It will point to magnetic north. And we kind of have that sort of built into us as well in a sense. We have a sort of me-centered thing that we have to overcome. And one of the ways I find personally helpful is just to show an interest in other people. To ask them questions. And actually to listen to the answers as well. And to try to find connection points or show understanding of what they're saying. Basically moving away from a me-centered conversation. Being proud tends to put us in the driving seat. I become the most important person. But God resists the proud. Gives grace to the humble. If we have a humble attitude, we're more likely... Also, to be hospitable to a wider section of people. What does it mean to be humble? Well, a couple of ways in which humility is shown or not shown 
is by good deeds done without fanfare. So good deeds, Jesus said that, didn't he? He said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't just let it all slip that you know, your good deeds, your successes and all that kind of thing so that you become the center of attention. You know, so I think that's one of the ways in which we can show a humble attitude. We can also show a humble attitude through our speech. You know, if our speech is gracious towards other people and is upbuilding towards them, then I think that demonstrates something of a humble attitude. There are probably other ways too. So Jesus says in this first part of the passage, have a humble attitude. Don't seek to exalt yourself. Don't seek also to get significance by bragging. Don't seek to get significance by telling tales of woe. That doesn't mean to say you can't talk about the difficulties that you're going through. It's how you go about it. It doesn't mean to say that you can't talk about some of the things that that have gone well in your life. It's just the motivation. Why are you doing it? If you're seeking affirmation from other people, it isn't going to work. But to love other people and to have a less me-centered approach when we deal with other people, we're much more likely to get significance and meaning. And show this humble attitude to others, Jesus is saying. The second thing Jesus is saying, and he turns to the host in verse 12, and he talks about gospel hospitality in effect. In that day, in Jesus' time, to get things done, you had to have connections. It was all done through hospitality, networking. What advantage could you gain from certain guests? Jesus is saying something radically countercultural here. When Jesus says in verse 12, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Is he saying you never invite your friends, you never invite your relatives, you never invite invite people who are wealthier than you? Is he saying you never do that? No, that's not actually his meaning. He's using an ancient Hebrew idiom, a Hebrew expression. It's a bit like when Jesus said, And he would often use exaggeration to make a point. So on another occasion, he says, unless you hate your mother and father, you can't be my disciple. Now, is he saying that you must hate your mother and father? Well, obviously, he's not saying you must hate your mother and father, because throughout the Bible, it talks about honoring your mother and father. So what's he saying in that instance? He's saying, actually, that the love that you have for me should be so much greater than the love and loyalty that you have for your parents. So when Jesus is saying, don't invite your friends and relatives and so on, he's not saying never invite them. He's saying, what he's saying is throw out this patronage system. This system whereby we, we get advantage from other people. He's saying use gospel, gospel hospitality. And the Greek word for hospitality, which I'm sure you're all longing to know, is philoxenia. And philoxenia apparently means the love of strangers. Not the networking of strangers to see what I can get out of them. Not the tolerance of strangers, but the love of strangers. And this word philoxenia also includes a generosity of spirit. Now, Hot off the press, because I only wrote this particular bit this morning because it only cropped up last night in conversation with some other friends. And I thought, ah, that will fit in really nicely with Philoxenia. My uh, parents-in-law, Frank and Eileen, a few years ago, they lived in a semi-detached house. And next door but one were some strangers. They didn't know them. A young couple with two little children. So there they were, living virtually next door to one another, but they were strangers. But gradually, Frank and Eileen invited this couple with their two kids into their home. It wasn't anything special. It was no great feast. It was just like having coffee, meeting other friends, just sharing a bit of life together. And these strangers became friends. And these strangers came to faith. In fact, these strangers... Uh, Alec and Sandra Thomas, who many of you will know. And these strangers, one of them, Alec became an elder here at King's Church High Wycombe. And now even today, Alec and Sandra are serving in the church. Not only that, but their two children, Paul and Nicola, both came to faith. And their son, Paul, is now an elder at King's Church Amersham. And their daughter runs a Christian charity in the slums of Uganda. 
And so I was thinking about it even this morning. I thought, ah, yeah. And also, in addition to that, Sandra's parents came to faith. I remember that. So from being people who live next door but one, they they were shown a bit of philoxenia, a bit of love to strangers. And now, great things have come out of that. So Jesus is talking about this kind of gospel hospitality. And in this case, it all started just very, very simply. Very quietly. There was no great fanfare. There was no great event happening. It was just a very slow burning process of demonstrating the love of God to others by welcoming them into your place of refuge. So this philoxenia is a radical generosity of spirit, of welcome, welcome, of valuing, of accepting someone. Hospitality is not simply entertaining somebody. Hospitality is more than inviting people around for a meal. It's something to do with welcome, certainly to do with the love of God. And in order to do this, in order to reach out to others that we don't know, we might not naturally connect with, then there may be certain things that we have to overcome. Certainly I find in my own experience, there are certain aspects of my own character and personality that I have to overcome in order for the love of God to be shown to others and to present a welcoming attitude towards them. Maybe it's our personality. So maybe you might think, well, I'm, I'm a kind of quiet and shy person. I'm not really given, I'm not extrovert. I, I generally keep to myself. So how am I going to do this? Or maybe it's our, uh, our natural inclination not to go beyond our own tribe or our own friendship group. By tribe, I, d- I just don't mean tribe in the sort of traditional African sense. I mean tribe in the sense of our own sort of social grouping. To go beyond that in order to reach out to others. Surely that's the call of the gospel. Surely that's what Jesus seeks to do as well. After all, he dined with tax collectors. He dined with publicans and sinners. I mean, if anybody should have been out of their comfort zone, boy, it should have been Christ. He came from the glory and the heights and the sublimeness of heaven. And he dined with publicans and sinners and he touched lepers. So if anyone was said to come out of their comfort zone, then surely it was Christ. Maybe we have to overcome some of our prejudices against people who are different from us in some way. Maybe they're from a different nation. Maybe they're from a different social background. Overcome our fear of difference. How are we going to do that? Well, If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and me, then surely he's going to help us to do that. Surely he's going to help me to overcome my shyness. Surely he's going to overcome my fear of strangers. So I want to look at, uh, briefly as well, three aspects of Christian hospitality. What it is, who it's for, and how can we be hospitable? What it is, who it's for, how can we be hospitable? Well, what it is, it's this. It's welcoming people into your living space and refreshing them with the ordinary things with which you refresh yourself. We say that again. Welcoming people into your living space and refreshing them with the ordinary things with which you refresh yourself. I love that word ordinary. You know, this is not... We're not inviting them to a feast. It's just an ordinary thing. And your living space might go beyond your home. Hospitality is inviting people into that living space. For example, I was recently invited out to to a cafe by someone. Uh, I'd never been to that cafe before. They obviously had. Because they told me that they'd normally sit in a particular seat and they'd tell me that they would read a newspaper or whatever it was, read their tablet, I can't remember now. And uh, invited me out for coffee. It was a place where they felt at home. It was a place where they felt comfortable. I'd never been before. That was my first time. So I was being invited into their extended living space, if you like. And we sat, we chatted for half an hour, we had coffee, actually I think I had tea, but uh, it was just nice and I felt refreshed. It's not, hospital is not about providing a five-star gourmet meal. It's inviting people to the place where you recharge your batteries. A place where you feel safe. A good home, it may be a place of comfort, of food, of rest, of shelter, and so on. To be invited into the very center of someone else's life. To be welcomed, it's rejuvenating, it's energizing. I've experienced that on many, many occasions. Even last year I was in Nepal. And uh, 
I was invited to my Nepali teacher's brother's house for a meal. I'd never met the brother before. I'd never met his wife before. I'd never met any of his four daughters or son before. So I went as a total stranger into their house. But I was made to feel welcome. And I felt relaxed. And I felt rejuvenated. And even though I, you know, I speak a little bit of the language, I, most I couldn't understand, but it didn't really matter because I knew I was made to feel welcome. So hospitality is bringing people into that place where you get re-energized and you can be a blessing them. You welcome them. It's an attitude as well as an action. I know that for Joy and me, when we invite people into our home, I don't want people to feel awkward. I want them to feel relaxed. I want them to feel as if they're part of the family. So for example, last weekend we hosted our... Uh, one of our granddaughter's birthday parties. It was her fourth birthday party. So I had no idea who was coming. Well, I knew a few people, parts of the family, but most of the people, I had no idea who they were. And uh, they came in, and I'd never seen most of them before. Some of them were from different cultures. One lady was Swedish. Another guy was Chinese background. And uh, so I, but I thought, well, you know, I want them to feel at home. So obviously I said, is there anything you'd like to drink? We'd like some tea, coffee, water, whatever. And... um, And then I said, please can you make yourself at home? I said, everybody else does. And uh, so for example, my family, they certainly make themselves at home. So when they come into our house, they head straight for the fridge. Or the cupboards. And then my son might say, there's no crisps. But anyway, it's about that sense of making people, you share what rejuvenates you. So think about that for a moment. What are the things that rejuvenate you? What are the things that energize you when you feel welcomed by others? When you feel accepted, accepted, when you feel valued? Can we then translate that to other people and help them to feel valued and help them to feel welcomed? So, who's it for? Uh, it's for other Christians. In Romans 12, 13, it says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. So it says, practice hospitality. Well, if you practice something, you do it more than once. When our children were little, I would practice with them how to catch a ball. Start with a big ball and a small gap between me and them. And then gradually... So maybe you're at that stage in your hospitality. Maybe you're at that stage where it will be a big ball and it will be a short space. Maybe you're at the stage in hospitality where it will be a small ball and a big space. So you are able to be hospitable to many different people from many different backgrounds, many different cultures. You do it frequently. You invite people into your living space. That's having the small ball and the long distance. And you can catch it with one hand as well. Maybe that's where you're at now. Well, bless you if you are. But maybe you're not at that stage. Maybe at the stage of big ball, small space. You know, people that you, you know not so well, but you know them a little bit, you feel fairly safe. All I would say is start from where you are in terms of hospitality and reveal something of the love of God to other people. Practicing hospitality can be like the branches of a tree growing outwards. As the branches of the tree grow, then more birds can come and rest in the branches. And maybe as well, those birds might start to sing all the more. Because as we reveal the love of God to other people, the intention is this, that they will become the people that God intends them to become. So when we show hospitality, yes, we may invite people for a real, but it's bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. It's about the kingdom coming. It's about people becoming all that God intended them to be. And I have to say that personally for me, if it hadn't been for the hospitality that I've been shown by many, many, many people in this church over many, many years, I wouldn't be in the place where I am now. I know I've still got a long, long way to go. But because of hospitality, going back to Frank and Eileen as well, I can remember before I'm... I knew their daughter and married her. They would invite me into their house and make me feel welcome and and give me a lift home. I was a single guy living at home. They were just so hospitable to me and revealed something of the love of God. And there was another couple in the early days who would invite me around their house. They had two sons, two young kids. They they just welcomed me and, and demonstrated something of the love of God. And that helped me establish a firm foundation in my life as a Christian. 
So I want to say thank you to anybody in, in any shape or form who has shown me any hospitality whatsoever down through the years. Bless you. Thank you. And I wouldn't be standing up on the stage if, if it wasn't for the hospitality that you've shown me. I'm pretty sure of that. So practice hospitality. It's for other Christians. It's also for strangers. Somebody you don't know and not like you. It might be your neighbors. Now I have to confess, I'm not very good at this. Joy, my wife, she's a lot better than I am at this. Um, I'm not very good at knowing my neighbors. I know the ones on my right and I know the ones on my left. Two doors down, I say hi. Hi. Three doors down, I've no idea. No idea who they are. If they were in a police line out, I wouldn't be able to identify them. Yeah. But it's something that as I've been studying this, I thought, it's something I need to work on. So in fact, on Friday, I was walking through the town at lunchtime and I saw our next door neighbors. And I thought, right, okay. So I went up and spoke to them. And I said, would you like to come around to our house? I said, we've been talking about this for a long time, da, 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 da. I thought, I must action this, not just talk about it. As it happens, they've got two kids. And they said, well, you come around now. So that's what we're doing later this evening. Maybe, so it's strange, maybe it's people you work with. Why invite them into your living space? It's to show them the love of God. That's what it is. People are generally loved towards belief. I certainly was. Yes, it was the truth that gripped me as well, but I experienced simultaneously the love of God. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Some strangers may become friends who become a particular blessing to you. When you think about it, how do friendships begin? If you think about the friends that you know, Were they at one point strangers? Were they at one point in your life people you did not know? So maybe there are... You see, I've been thinking about this as well. Are the people who I live nearby to, am I living there by accident? Or am I living there by divine appointment? Are the people who live near me there by accident? Or are they there by divine appointment? You know, I, I know someone who talks a lot about fate. They say, oh, it's fate. If you talk about something Christian, dee, 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 they'll say, it's fate. Well, I don't believe in fate. I don't believe in astrology and that it's all written in the stars, so it's fate that this is going to happen. Do you? Or do you believe in divine appointment? Do you believe in the purposes of God? Do you believe in the planning of God? Do you believe that God is has brought you to the place where you are living at this moment in your life? If so, what about those who live around you? We have to start where we are as well. There's no good me saying to you, do this, do that, do the other, if you're at the big ball stage. But wherever you're at, I would encourage you, and I'm sure the Lord would encourage you, to reach out to those around you. So it's for strangers. Maybe it's for people <coughs> people. People you don't know, strangers can become friends. So it's for other Christians, it's for strangers, it's also for the poor. Jesus talks about that here. So what's meant by the poor? Well, the poor may be people who are in a mess. The lives are all higgledy-piggledy, upside down. They don't know the left arm from the right arm. The house is in chaos. The lives are in a mess. I wonder, were any of our lives in a mess? At any stage of our life? If I look back at mine, I think, wow, certainly it was. How did I get out of that mess? <laughs> it was the love of God and the love of other people that brought me through. So it's for the poor. People who are in a mess or literally poor. They ain't got much money. They're in no position to invite you back. They're in no position to reciprocate the hospitality that you show them. People from whom you gain no social advantage at all. God may well make them your friends. And I'm proud of our church in many ways. We're not perfect. I know that. There's a long way to go. I appreciate that as well. But I think we do a lot of things to help welcome people from different backgrounds, different abilities, and all that kind of stuff. And, I'm, and, and I want to say this as well, that that is such a blessing. Yeah, it's such a blessing to have people from different social backgrounds, 
different wealth backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds. It's so great. It's enriching. It's a reflection of the kingdom of God, what God wants. So the third thing, how can we be hospitable? How can we do it then? I've got a few suggestions here. There are probably lots more that you can think of, but here are a few, and I'll run through them fairly quickly. The first one is, invite people into your home. And when I think about our neighbours, if I wait for all the circumstances to be right, they never do seem to be right. That's why on Friday when I saw our neighbours in the town, I thought, right, bite the bullet now and just do it. Don't wait for all the circumstances to be right, otherwise it's never going to happen. So maybe that's what we can do. Invite them into our home. Or as happened to me, go to one of the regular cafes you go to. If you're a coffee drinker, (coughs) you like having a, a break somewhere, invite them there. Just have a chat. Nice and easy. You don't have to do a lot. And so on. Have a small group in your home. We're very keen on small groups here at King's. You might think, I don't want to lead a group. No, no, no. No, you don't have to. You could host it. Just have them in your home. And you could make the teas and coffees or whatever. That releases the leaders to be able to chat. And you can get to know people as well. That's now a measure of hospitality. We also get involved in Wickham Homeless Connection. And that's well out of many people's comfort zones. That's probably the small wall. Try to catch it with one hand. But maybe you think, yeah, I could do that. With our uh, night shelter. I know it's just finished, but it's something to think about where we can be hospitable to other people and welcome them into our place you know, in the Western Hall. This is a place that if you're a church member, uh, you know about, you, you feel safe in. Welcome people into that. Or perhaps it's be on the welcome team, as simple as that. Literally welcoming strangers. If you've been here long enough for this home, for this church to feel like your home church, where you know the routines and you know quite a few people, then it's an opportunity to be welcoming, to be hospitable for those for whom it isn't. As people come in, you know, I've had experiences where I've gone into a church cold, as it were. In other words, I've never been to that church before. And, and the welcome that you get, or the lack of it, is so important. So welcoming is another way in which we could be involved in hospitality. It, even simpler than that is in the mingle time. I used to hate this. You know, when the leader would stand up here and say, okay, turn around and say hello to somebody you don't know. I used to cringe. I used to think, I don't want to do that. Why on earth would I want to do that? I just prefer to talk with my friends. But I felt challenged about that. And I thought, no, no, that's not right. <laughs> you, need to, you need to do what you're told. Not only that, but I thought it's a good thing as well. So I had to overcome something in me. My natural reticence. My natural shyness not to want to do that. So I forced myself and said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to look for someone I've never seen before. They may have been coming three years. I don't know. And so I've developed in my own thinking a kind of pattern, a phrase that I kind of use uh, when I go and do the mingle bit. So I'll go up to someone and say, hi, I'm Ron. Can you just tell, have I spoken with you before? Have I spoken with you before? That's fairly good because I say, yeah, you spoke with me last week. Don't you remember? <laughs> so, it's a, it's, but it's another way in which we can be hospitable. And for me, I think maybe for some of you, that might be the small ball. For others, it's probably the big ball. I think for most of you, it's probably the, the big ball. You can do that fairly easily. Um, but sometimes we can, we can undervalue those things, small things actually, which can, can lead to big opportunities. If you're a church member, for example, you could become a CAP befriender. Christians Against Poverty, some of you are, I know. As a befriender, you give value, you give dignity, showing the love of God to that person or family. Again, that's a, an aspect of hospitality, of revealing the love of God, where you're bringing someone into a place where you feel safe and you get energized, or you go into their place, even more amazing, and you bring the light of Christ and the love of God to other people. Or maybe it's our our little stars work here where we have our parent and toddler group. And again, we know this place pretty well if you've been coming here some time. Other people come in from different cultural backgrounds. A whole uh, raft of different nations come here at our uh, parent and toddler group. So perhaps that's an area in which you might like to be involved in order to show hospitality. Maybe you think, well, I haven't got a big home. I've only got a small home where I, I'm not really in a position to invite people. 
or I, I, I'm not very well off financially. You know, it's tight enough as it is without me having to do any extra. Well, you could come here, be part of the welcome team. You could come here and help in little stars. You could get involved as a cat befriender. There's different ways, is all I'm saying, in which hospitality can be demonstrated. Jesus says in verse 16 to finish, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. God is inviting us all to a great banquet. Many make excuses as to why they won't go. It's a slap in the face to the master. Go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in, he says. The Lord, in other words, extends his hospitality to the ends of the earth so those who are far away, including you and me, get invited to his great feast. At the end of time, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the perfect home, full of love and eternal bliss. Instead of being strangers to God, he wants to make us his friends. Instead of being an outsider, God wants to make us insiders. And he did that through Jesus becoming a rejected outsider, homeless, an exile, dying outside the city. Jesus was the ultimate insider, but he was abandoned so that instead of being outsiders, we could come home and be insiders. The Lord invites us to his feast, to his banquet. If you have never responded or have not yet responded to his invitation, then we are going to give you an opportunity to do that in the next part of our meeting. Bless you. Thank you for the love of God and the hospitality that you've shown me. You'd be surprised. Thank you for the welcome that you've given me. You're a blessing now. And I'm sure you are already doing it, but do it all the more. Go and be hospitable to others in order that they might become the people that God wants them to be. Amen. Amen.